First of all, many thanks to Professor Indrek Grauber, to Professor Massimo La Torre, to the University of Tallinn for inviting me to speak at this uh, atypical and prestigious conference, a conference in spite all. Uh, the topic of my contribution concerns one of the greatest legal philosophers of the 20th century, Gustav Radbruch. The title of my paper is uh, Gustav Radbruch and a Critical Concept of the State. The focus of my reflection is the analysis of Radbruch's concept of the state. At the end of this examination, I hope to be able to arrive at an acceptable definition of state and to demonstrate two related corollaries. The first corollary concerns the representation of Radbruch as a legal positivist philosopher who only converted to traditional natural law after 1945. My thesis is that this is an inadequate representation. First of all, because Radbruch had always been a sui generis legal positivist. He was already a peculiar legal philosopher at the beginning of his academic and scientific biography. In my opinion, it would therefore be more correct to define him as a critical legal positivist. Furthermore, it is inadequate because even after the fall of Hitler's regime, he never became a traditional natural lawyer that is an exponent of a natural law theory still founded on metaphysical principles. The second corollary concerns more specifically the concept of state. At the beginning of the 20th century, Radbrook's philosophical thought presents a critical normative concept of state. This evidence shows the continuity of his thought, despite the understandable internal evolution that took place after the Second World War. <coughs> The new reference to a non-positivistic concept of law is only partially a revolution in his philosophical reflection. There are significant elements of persistence. On the other side, this internal re-elaboration was for him necessary and a moral duty, because German jurists in the past should have had the courage to condemn the Nazi perversion of the law and they had the duty to confront themselves and their theories with 12 years of Nazi totalitarianism. This conviction is clearly expressed in Fünf Minuten der Rechtsphilosophie, which appeared in the Rhein-Neckar Zeitung in September 1945 issue. As a premise, it should be noted that the question, what is the state, is not the center of the Rechtsphilosophie. Nonetheless, it is explicitly addressed in paragraph 26 of the third new expanded edition of 1932. In relation to the concept of law and therefore also implicitly to the concept of state, a so-called first Radbruch and a so-called second Radbruch is often referred to in order to underline the radical evolution of his thought. In this perspective, Radbruch's philosophy of law would be transformed from legal positivism to classical or outdated natural law theory. It is certainly true that for Radbruch, these are his words, the collapse of the state of national socialist illegality raises new questions for German jurisdiction that traditional positivism is not capable of resolving. For him, these issues must be dealt with a clear assumption of responsibility, reflecting again on the theoretical and epistemological status of the category of natural law. It is therefore quite understandable and indeed inevitable that, as, as is stated in Neue Probleme in der Rechtswissenschaft, in the form of this supralegal law, the old idea of natural law, after an apparent death lasting a hundred years, has experienced its own resurrection. However, Radbruck is also aware that one must be careful when identifying today's supralegal law with the previous natural law. It does not share the supranational and atemporal immutability of the natural law of the past. It is a natural law with variable content, which changes according to the age and the people. 
The issue regarding the definition of the state is not easy to solve. He probably found himself in a sort of impasse, caught between the extremes of dominant legal positivism and a now unconvincing natural law. The answer of the question has to be found by rereading Radbrook's text, from which a clearer idea of the complexity of his legal positivist theory of the Weimar years can be gained, and therefore also a clear idea of the origins of the peculiar natural law approach of the post-World War II period, which are mainly represented by the two short works, Fünf Minuten Rechtsphilosophie and Gesetzliches Unrecht und Übergesetzliches Recht in 1946. Radbrook's legal positivism never brought about mere legalism. It was always anchored to the minimum standards of morality, including that of the Kantian echo of the moral duty of conduct in accordance with the law. In order to define the idea of a state, Radbruch, in his book Rechtsphilosophie, starts by distinguishing between the actual concept, Wirklichkeitsbegriff, and the legal concept, Rechtsbegriff, of a state. Ronald Dworkin, almost a century later, would probably have called the former a criterial concept and the latter an interpretative concept of state. The difference between the two concepts is, is of great importance. It is the same enormous difference that involves, for example, the term Art, Kunst, which at the same time has been an ideal concept, a model with which to expel what is not artistic from the domain of art, and a real concept that embraces all the works of art of a period, both the artistic and the kitsch ones. Or even the term science, Wissenschaft, which on the one hand means the instrument of truth of a cognitive activity with which to declare false knowledge as being unscientific, and on the other hand, means a historical culture concept, concept that embraces both scientific truth as much as an error in a neutral way. Or lastly, the term culture, kultur, which can be understood both as, as an ideal model for historical and social cultural realities and as the totality of all these cultural facts. Moreover, as a legal concept, the term state is valid either as an authentic or formal echte Rechtsbegriff that corresponds to the legal institution as such, for example, the German Reich as the implementation of the Weimar Constitution. Or it is valid as a relevant legal concept that is substantive, material, rechtliche relevante begriff, representative of the rights and duties of the state established in the Weimar Constitution in which it frequently occurs. On the basis of this premise, of this semantic duplicity and conceptual tension, a further question arises, which is also useful for answering the first question regarding the concept of state. What relationship is there between state as a legal concept and law. According to Radbrook, law and power, or rather, the idea of law and the idea of state, do not identify themselves with one another. The law and the purpose of the state, or reason of state, can conflict with the purpose of legal certainty and with the idea of justice, of course. This is what, unfortunately, becomes all too evident during the years of Nazism. Going back to the Rex philosophy, it is eloquent that Radbruch reformulates and applies the outdated Hume's rule, without mentioning it by name, to the state, affirming that the normativity of the factual, the normativité des factischen, is a paradox. You can't derive an ought, sollen, from an is, sein, a fact, that uh, a fact such as the conception of a given period can become normative only if a norm has given it normativity. From this awareness, it does not take long to start talking about natural law, especially if we are dealing with a specific aspect of natural law and the linked interpretative concept of the state. In 1932, Radbrook writes, when there is a holder of supreme power in a community, 
his commands must be obeyed. Indeed, the purpose of legal certainty implies that the state must also be subject to the laws. The very idea of certainty that calls upon the state to legislate, I'm quoting again, also requires subjection to the laws. The state is called upon to legislate only on condition that it is subject to its laws. Therefore, the state is subject to its own positive law by means of a metapositive, natural law, by means of that some precept which alone can merge the validity of positive law. The concept of state implies a claim of correctness of the law from which it is inferred that it is not legibus solutus. Against Hobbes, the state in, it itself, in its essence is a state of law and therefore subject to the law. In fact, summarized Radbrook, thoroughly thought out, juridical and state positivism presupposes a natural law principle. There is a further limitation to be considered regarding the principle of equality or perhaps it would be more correct to say impartiality. The same principle that in the two-year period, 1945-1946, will be defined by Radbrook as a fundamental principle of every democratic ideal of justice. The same is at the basis of the conflict between the constitutional state, Rechtsstaat, and the unconstitutional state, Unrechtsstaat. An order of the state, it continues in paragraph 26 of the Rex philosophy, which claims to be valid only for some individuals or for some particular case, would not be right but arbitrary. He therefore concludes, the interest of the ruling class does not emerge in its nakedness but takes an a juridical form. And the form of law, regardless of its content, is always at the service of the dominated. Not only is it at their service, but for the dominated, the less advantaged and the weak. It is always better to be dependent on the state and the law than to live together in its absence and anomie. At this point, it is clear why and in what direction Radbruch, as long as it was possible, had tried to make the constitutional legal system in force in Germany fairer before the advent of Nazism. He did so in particular through his personal civil and political commitment. In this sense, the work of the, the, work of the Weimar period entitled Volk im Staat in which he exhibits all the critical potential of his ideal conception of the state and the centrality of the principle of equality as its criterion of legitimation is synthetic and crystalline. Radbruch also uses harsh words of denunciation when he passes from the ideal plan to describing the Wirklichkeit. Not equality, but the, but the inequality of individuals, the inequality of possession, the inequality of education, in the best of cases always also inequality of the system and conditioned by this inequality between rulers and the ruled, often between commanders and the commanded. We have to be careful, Radbrook wrote, majorities are enhanced minorities. In 1918, however, the pamphlet entitled And die Jungen Juristen aimed at promoting the ideal of a democratic republic had already been published. In fact, the republic had already been effectively established in 1919 with the drafting of a constitution in which Radbrook played a significant role. Between 1920 and 1924, he was first elected to the Reichstag and subsequently appointed Minister of Justice twice. The first time was for a year between 1921 and 1922 in the cabinet of Josef Wirth, and then for just four months in 1923 in the government of Gustav Stresemann. His activity as a reformer at the time was mainly directed toward the German penal code and to issues of social justice for which he made a committed effort to raise public opinion. His commitment to abolishing the death penalty should also be remembered. 
maintaining that the legalization of murder was incompatible with the principle of prevention of penalty. His political and legal battle for the inclusion of women in the judiciary and more generally in the administration of justice is also a great importance. This was a struggle that he led from within the institution and advocated demonstrating its constitutionality on the basis of the Article 109. All Germans are equal in front of the law. In principle, men and women have the same rights and obligation. His support was a decisive factor in the promulgation in July 1922 of the pivotal but troubled and opposed Gesetzt über die Zulassung der Frauen für zu den Ämter und Berufen der Rechtspflege. From this overall picture, in my opinion, the similarity between Radbruch's sense of justice and the concept of law and state that he would soon develop and which after 1945 he would strengthen and develop further is evident. It is therefore improper and not acceptable by me to see a betrayal in this evolution of his thought. Some interpreters have gone so far as to declare themselves surprised to express their reproach towards him because, I'm quoting, in 15 years, he would have responded in a completely different way to the pivotal problem of the philosophy of law, that is, the problem of the relationship within, with, uh, between legal validity and justice. Commenting, in addition, that, always I'm, I'm quoting, for a philosopher of law, this is surprising. The truthfulness of philosophical assertions about law, unlike sociological juridical ones, does not depend on an empirical verification and therefore cannot even be falsified by historical events, such as the rule of national socialism. The point is that Radbrook expressed the opposite belief, that the duty of responsibility lies with the jurist and the philosopher. In 1945, in the draft revision of his Einführung in die Rechtswissenschaft, he noted that in the following issue of the work, the reconsideration or the, the new formation, formation of law in relation to the time of the Nazi regime had to be treated in a particular way. Radbruch is not a traitor. This has also been argued but, if anything, is someone who, in the face of history, has had the honesty to revise his idea. In this sense, what gives his idea strength is the same conviction that Hannah Arendt also theorized a decade later, going as far as denying the Nazi regime, the Nazi law, and the power of its Führer, the possibility of still being considered a state, a law, and a sovereign, respectively. They moved on the grounds of the most violent abuse, of a criminal legality, but the oxymoron is only apparent. As you will recall, Arendt, in his epilogue to the Eichmann trial, had raised a question. What sovereignty does a state like the Nazi state have? Can we apply the principle that applied to regime in which crime and violence are exceptions and borderline cases to a regime in which crime is legal and indeed the rule, the rule? The question becomes one of whether the concept of sovereignty and the meaning of the term state holds. The question becomes that of the just distinction between the, an unjust state and a non-state. The space of the concept of state if adequately understood, is intermediate between the ideal of a well-ordered society and a criminal regime that denies the very category of state. This tension between the extremes basically characterizes the very sphere of law as such. In the concluding remarks of paragraph 13 of the Rex Philosophy, Radbruch notes, law lives in a fragile balance always threatened and constantly having to be rebuilt in the midst of polar tensions. Moreover, I'm concluding, 
a clear indication of Radbrook's position could already be seen from the exerg chosen for the paragraph 26, the one dedicated to the concept of the state as a constitutional state on which I focused. Delivered to the pen of the liberal spirit of Friedrich Schiller, this exerg reads, be wary, noble sir, that the good of the state does not appear to you as right. Thank you. <laughs>